G'day guys, uh, it's not 2.22, as you can see on the screen there, um, but it is interesting how I can continue to see, like everybody else, these unusual increments that are sort of, you know, 111, 11.11, 2.22, 3.33, 4.44, I have seen so many of them, I continue to see them, I don't know what it means. Possibly nothing. Uh, I just want to do a video. Um, this isn't a teaching. This is just some ideas, but they do have some scriptural um, foundation and basis for me to think the way I am. So I'll present them to you with the verses and uh, you can make of it what you will. It is about Esther and for some reason... I don't know whether it's God or my stubbornness or what, but if you refer back through my videos some time ago, I did one about Esther and the reversal of the feasts from um, feast days into morning. In uh, Esther, it refers to uh, morning being turned into feast days. So morning as in grieving, not the time of the day. So before I start the video, I just want to mention some things that you'll read in Esther. And I'm being very careful how I say Esther. I'm still messing it up. Uh, Sister DJ laughs at me all the time because us Aussies tend to say Esther, in Esther instead of Esther. I don't know how you'd say it properly anyway because it's got a TH in there, so it'd be Esther. <laughs> anyway, out of Esther, there is, and I'm not going to go through the whole of Esther, nor all the events in there, nor all the possible timelines, etc., uh, nor am I even going to relate this to a specific day on the timeline, other than to say Purim. Now, from the get-go, when I mention Purim, I am specifically talking about 29th of February this year. I believe in accordance with Repo Man that that is when Purim actually is. Now, he did a study that showed us very clearly, for some reason, the Jews are announcing it that it's the 23rd or something of March this year. I'm not sure of the exact date, so don't quote me. But when you do the biblical math, which uh, is fairly easy, uh, according to Mike, it should be on February. Now, this year, February is a leap year, which only occurs once every four years. I found that interesting, too, because there's lots of references to four in the Bible. And, uh, you know, that p potentially being a four-day wait or something like that. Uh, which only occurs every four years because it would normally have been, I think, on the 25th of February this year. But uh, I'm not sure about that, or maybe the 28th, but then it has to occur on the 29th. But Mike's the expert on that. Go and have a look at his videos pertaining to Purim and when he believes the correct date to be. Regardless of whether it's uh, on Mike's date or whether it is on the uh, traditional Jewish date, as we can Google online, which is in March sometime, 23rd. For the purpose of this video, uh, don't think it matters a whole lot, uh, as you'll hear when we get to the end. So some of the things I gleamed from Esther, Esther, uh, is that there is a definite distinction in there showing the law versus grace, okay? Now, that can be seen, a, a very um, clear example of that and the typology thereof can be seen when, uh, if you were to come before the king uh, uninvited, then the normal rule of law was death, okay? Now, we know, according to Scripture, that no man can fulfill the law and the law itself condemns us to death. So, so there's a parallel there between Jewish law 
and uh, the law associated with um, approaching the king. But we also see that if the king was to extend his golden scepter, then that person would be free from that law, which would require death. They could approach the, the king and uh, do whatever they were there for. So, that to me definitely represents typology of the blood of Jesus, for sure. So, under the law, we're condemned to death, but through the works, the sacrifice of our precious Saviour Jesus, we attain life. So, I, I instantly noticed that uh, there was typology there of a rapture. Now, some other things that I bought out. Um, Esther, chapter 5, where she approached the king. For her, that was a life and death moment. That was a uh, point at which she was either under the law and condemned to death or where she fell under the grace of the king and received life, so to speak. Isn't that so, so um, indicative of uh, the salvation that we get through Jesus? Funny, the book of Esther doesn't mention God anywhere for some reason. I've heard various reasons as to why that is, but uh, it's very interesting, um, that particular fact. I wonder if that somehow alludes to the choice we have to make as far as uh, accepting Jesus, you know, our free will choice that uh, sort of whilst predestined based on that choice, that that's a point in time where we're really, it's sort of us or God, the world or God, if you know what I mean. God kind of steps aside to allow us to make that choice almost. Anyway, that's an interesting little thing I just thought of. It's probably not right, but so some other typologies like, let's see. Uh, so there's the obvious example of law and death there. The scepter is like the blood of Jesus equals life. Scepter extended, right? It wasn't just that the king, uh, as outlined in Esther, would extend the scepter. You had to then touch it. There's a choice there, okay? So that's almost like, you know, how God calls all men, you know, but uh, not everybody chooses him. Not everybody accepts the gift. Jesus knocks at the door. Not everybody opens it. So the extension of the scepter uh, is almost like uh, God's calling to us. And the, then the acceptance uh, was to touch it and then receive life uh, and therefore be able to approach the king. Uh, and, and that is very um, reminiscent of what we know uh, our salvation is, uh, the, you know, the acceptance of Jesus, uh, confession with our mouth, belief in our heart, uh, his blood covering us, and then being able to approach the king. Uh, as something else I found interesting, and I'm going to skip through the pictures associated with what I'm saying uh, towards the end, I'll just speak of it now, is that we can find the mention of the word gold in the, in the Bible a lot, many verses, many occurrences and golden uh, there are also quite a, there's a few occurrences of the verse scepter as well however in all of the bible there are eight occurrences of golden scepter and all of those eight occurrences occur in three verses found only in the book of esther so that to me golden scepter and the scepter in Esther being very reminiscent of uh, a division between, or the king's scepter being a division between the law and death and, uh, you know, um, grace, life, that sort of thing. So I saw a very strong typology there, um, which pointed to the removal of the law. Now, I'll explain that in a little bit. So... We are waiting for the sting of death to be removed. I'm paraphrasing with all these things. We already have salvation, so we know 
death doesn't overcome us. We have spiritual salvation, but people still here on earth, uh, Christian people who are saved, still may go through death. I mean, people are dying every day. Good Christian people are dying every day still. So we are waiting for not only um, our Lord to return for the Harpozo, for the rapture, Harpazo, however you want to pronounce it, but at that point in time, truly for the believer, the sting of death will no longer exist. So we have spiritual life already, but uh, the incorruptible, immortal body part hasn't come yet. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I didn't necessarily, because the uh, scepter and the extending of the scepter in Esther pointed towards... Um, physical life, not necessarily spiritual life, okay, I therefore saw that as a connection to the rapture when the sting of death's gone. Physical life will be immortal, okay? So I put the point of Esther, uh, the, at, at, in Esther at uh, chapter 5, where the uh, King was um, we extended the scepter, and Esther essentially then got life for herself and all the Jews. I saw that as the point at which the rapture would most likely occur. I saw Purim because of all the death and destruction, etc., associated with Purim, uh, deception, uh, where Haman's little plan was turned around in favour of the Jews. I saw all of that as events that I would associate with tribulation, warfare, etc., etc. So I wrote a few notes. I'll read them out. Let's see if uh, they still remain valid now that I've said what I've said. Uh, sting of death removed at salvation, but physical death still remains. The exception is the harpozo. So we, we still undergo physical death now, but at the Rapture, that will no longer be the case. The sting of death will be gone. The scepter represented the removal of physical death under the law pertaining to Esther's in uninvited presentation before the king. So she was uninvited to go before the king, yet the king extended the scepter and therefore she uh, managed to avoid physical death, which is what w will happen at the rapture. See, I see, that's why I see verse 5 as a rapture verse. Though our, uh, through our salvation, we have been given spiritual uh, life, but may still go through physical death. At the rapture, physical death for the believer no longer has any sting, which is true, we know that. Therefore, that is why I see verse 5 uh, in Esther where she approached the king is more likely to be the rapture time frame um, and the fact that Purim is now no longer my main focus for a high rapture watch date, I guess I need to explain that. Now, as I alluded to, I think that uh, Purim shows a lot of tribulation type events. But also in a previous video I mentioned there seems to be an unusual change from what we expect pre-rapture, which is at the time of the rapture we expect the Jewish feast days to be turned into mourning, right? And we'd expect that to be the case for seven years. After all, God's returning his attention to the Jews and they're undergo, under, they are going to undergo all sorts of hardships um, in order to try and wake them up to the fact that uh, their Messiah was always Jesus and they crucified him. However, at the end of that seven-year period when Jesus returns and the new Jerusalem is here and he reigns for a thousand years, I would imagine the Jewish feast days that were turned into mourning during the rapture at that point in time 
would definitively then become joyous. And if when I flick through the pictures uh, for Esther, you'll see that it, there's clear mention that mourning will be turned into feasts, sorrow will be turned into joy. I think that would occur at Purim 2031. Therefore, based on the same logic of Purim being something that occurs during the tribulation, I would assume that Purim 2024, and interestingly it, it's unusual that it occurs on a leap year this year, um, and I wonder what the day counts are between Purim now, 2024, and Purim in 2031. I can't even work out when the Jews are saying Purim is going to be in 2031. But because I believe that uh, the Esther and the um, you know the feasts from which Purim's name was derived, it was uh, originally called Pur, P-U-R, when they cast lots and from that it became Purim, you know, that had potential to be a horrific time and essentially it was. A lot of people were killed regardless of whether it uh, was uh, the attackers instead of the Jews. Um, and we know that during uh, the tribulation it is also going to be the attackers that are destroyed and not the Jews because we know God's going to supernaturally protect Israel. Therefore, I see Purim 2024 probably... 29th of February, according to Mike's timeline, as being the beginning of uh, tribulation. And I think 2031, Purim, might be the end of it when finally the Jews' mourning uh, is turned back into joy. You know, their feast days are turned back into joy. Not as we're expect expecting it pre-rapture, we're expecting their feast days to be turned into mourning. So that's why I'm making that distinction. So I'll flip through a few pictures. Uh, right, that was the bit where we established in Esther that uh, yeah, the law was that you were to be put to death if you came before the king uninvited, yet the extension of the scepter then changed that. So that's where I determined, you know, a, a sort of uh, grace versus the law uh, typology. Pretty clear one, I'd say. What have we got here? I might have to zoom in a bit. Okay. So this is the part. I've got written Grace Law up there. This is the part where I see in, in Chapter 5 that significant point in time where Esther was under the law and should have been killed but then suddenly became under grace and, and had life. I see this as more likely the point when we have the rapture, and this is before Purim. I can't give you a date before Purim. I wish somebody could suss all this out. I just don't have the smarts for it all the time right now. Uh, what do we got here? Okay, okay, this is how, right, this is when Purim was established. So, as Repo Man uh, said, and I did in videos some time ago also, you know, there was 13, 14, and 15. They were the dates. Okay, in uh, the outskirts, outside of Susa, they were allowed to uh, protect themselves on the 13th. In Susa, they had the 13th and the 14th because they also needed to get rid of Haman's sons. So it was all extended a day. And then the uh, feast was made on the 15th day, given that in Susa, they were still warring on the 14th day. So that was just to bring that out. But it also here, you know, there's some pretty strong wording here about Purim will never um, cease to be celebrated by the Jews, which tells me uh, it will probably go on through the tribulation. And I can imagine the first Purim outside of the seven-year tribulation with Jesus here, Jerusalem all established, everything back how it should be. I imagine that would be a Purim where definitely mourning was turned into feasts again. Hence my spiel on that. Uh, what do we got here? Um, oh, yeah, that was just the page where it showed the uh, casting of the lots and uh, how the name Purim came about. Uh, what was this one? 
no, same, same again. I was just showing that uh, um, why they observe uh, observe this on 13, 14 and 15. Okay, let's see. So to back up the fact that we are pre-rapture expecting their feasts to be turned into mourning, I'd refer to verses like this in Amos. But something else that tells me that this is um, an event that happens at the rapture is when I go to this. Same verse you can see there about turning feasts into mourning, but if you have a look at uh, chapter 11, oh, sorry, same chapter, but if you have a look at verse 11, I mess that up all the time. Now, what are we expecting at the rapture? We're expecting the removal of the believers. Some say also the Holy Spirit. I don't know about that, but I do know that Christians will be gone. What will that immediately result in? A famine. A famine of what? Hearing the words of the Lord. There'll be no one to speak them. There'll be nobody to preach them. Okay, so Amos therefore tells me, we are waiting for their feasts to be turned into mourning. Right? I believe that will happen at the rapture. And I believe that's backed up by the fact that it says then not long afterwards that there will be a, a famine of, uh, of the Lord, uh, of the word. So clearly that's saying that, you know, at the point their feasts are turned into mourning also, there will be a famine of the word. Why will be there be a famine of the word? Because the Christians are gone. So I hope all of that makes sense. Here are the only three occurrences in the Bible of golden scepter, and they're all in Esther. Isn't that interesting? Gold itself occurs 428 verses 530 times. So it's not like gold's an unusual word in the Bible, but it certainly is in relation to golden scepter. That's all I have for you guys right now. All I can say is, and I could be wrong, I think Purim, 29th of February, is possibly into the tribulation or at the very least the beginning of the tribulation. I feel we go before then. I can't give you any specifics as to when and where and why. I hope somebody can, but I find this very interesting because the Lord will just not let me let go of this, those verses where there's a reversal of feasts to mourning and mourning to feasts, joy to sadness, sadness to joy. It's not what we're expecting pre-rapture. So I hope somebody else can elaborate on this, but regardless of whether I'm right, wrong, part right or completely wrong, or however you want to frame it, I am still looking for our blessed hope to return. I know that my only access to the Father is through Jesus Christ and his perfect words, works. His blood and sacrifice cover my sin, past, present and future. That does not relieve me of the responsibility to try and live my best life according to the instructions and the examples that he left behind in the Bible. But it does mean when I slip up, those sins are covered. Give thanks for all things, people. Know that you have been given a gift that you could not achieve yourself. You had a bill that you could not possibly pay. And you had a debt that demanded death. Yet through the blood of our Saviour and his gift, you are forgiven and we will be together soon. God bless. Amen.